Yes. Uh, as I said earlier on, you've been uh, very instrumental in the Ghanaian music industry. But I would like to know the genesis of your journey, right from where you started till when you laid your hands on the digital uh, boards to create music with your own sound. Uh, okay. Um, thank you once again. I think as far as uh, my career is concerned, it started way back in uh, 1994. I was then, you know, preparing for my own level and go sleep at home. That was when uh, a friend of mine who celebrated his birthday and, you know, someone gifted him a piano, a very small piano. His name is Nana Sapun um, in Bubuashi, where I grew up, you know. And that was how I came close to music. I saw the piano and I fell in love with the piano, you know. So from there, my church at the time, that was Assemblies of God Emmanuel. Notice my talent, they, you know, they pushed me into um, favoring it at Oriental School of Music in Adabraka, which is, is known, the school is known now. And also from there, I moved to um, Resurrection Power and Living Bread, because the daughters of Glorious Jesus were their Tego sisters. I moved there because, like, when you look at the church, I mean, it basis was music, you know, so far who started with Tego sisters. So in basis was was music, and I didn't want to go the band way where I would enjoy a band like you know Myros because of the you know the lifestyle that people suppose you know musicians have in the band. And since I was a Christian and from the Christian background, I decided to stay in the church. You know, so that was how. So, but for Nana Sapon's intervention by giving you bringing a piano to your house, yeah, and you spend day yeah, and night and on, the on the piano. So the daddy experience that no this boy wouldn't do the economy yeah. he will not become an economist but rather become a music engineer yeah did actually, he realize yeah, that yeah i was staying with my mom who realized that i come from a family where you know i'm the first boy from the whole extended family we don't really have you know, like ladies women my cousins are all girls sisters aunties no uncles so i was like the first boy and my mom then she's now retired she was then working with snake and my dad was with um, psychiatric hospital who is deceased me so rest in peace you know so my mom noticed what i was trying to do and she had a big problem with me so there are times she would you know i'm not that tall my mom will take the piano put it on the wardrobe because she knows there was no way i could reach it just to you know discourage me from being who i am today but hey you know I, I kept fighting. Somebody may say what God has put in together, nobody yeah, no can put. put <laughs> but let's let's look at it from this way. Uh, when you were having the the obstacles or experiencing some obstacles from mommy, mm -hmm. did somebody in the family encourage you to pursue your hard desire career? Yeah, it was. Um, I think my my lead grandma. She, you know, she is not really educated, but she supported. What I was doing because they could all see I have so much love for it. Because when I go to school, you know, my the time I have literature in school is the same time I have music and I have to choose between the two. And I, I have so much love for literature, but hey, I will run from literature and I'll go to music. So my grandma was, you know, she was like, she was the one who knew was okay. But apart from that, my dad, my dad, my mom, everybody was like, you know, you have to go to school. So after the Living Bread, uh, when you joined the Living Bread, Mm -hmm. and playing the musical mm -hmm. instrument mm -hmm. there. What again motivated yeah. you to go into your own entrepreneurship? Okay. What happened in Living Bread um, was this, like there is a guy in the band, like in the church band, called Fred Che Mensa, popularly known as Fredima or Fredima Studios in Adabraka. He was manager of Shell, Ringo Adabraka, but he owned a studio. And he also played keyboard and I was playing keyboards in the church. So, seeing my interest and my love and probably how good he thought I was with the music and my creativity in the choir, he was like, I have a studio, you want to have a look one day? I'm like, whoa, what's a studio like? I've never seen the studio before. Thanks to Fred Chambers, uh, wherever he is. You know, he took me to the Adabraka around, you know, PTC, yeah, about it. That was the first time I saw keyboard connected to computer. I've never seen wow. it before. I was I, seriously and when I saw it I just didn't want to go out I didn't want to go home I didn't want to do nothing I just want to spend day and night in the studio so I could also make my own music because in the church we play you know copyright songs that people sing who will learn as yeah. a choir and musicians and performing 
But in the studio, you get to produce something, and some choir in some just get to listen to what you have done, and you know, learn it. So to me, it was like I'm like uh, I just fell in love with it. So that was how it all started in Fedema Studios, where you know I, I started. Then you know, the, um, guitar music had been introduced to the industry. Where like when I say guitar music, what I mean is like the infusion of technology, like computers, has been yep. introduced. Because then it used to be live band. If you want to record, you have to move your whole band to Ghana. From yeah, Spain. Alan, uh, did you do that of analog music before yes, you I went to analog, digital? Yes, I did analog. I did, uh, you know, uh, uh, what it is is analog music, you know, digital music tried to incorporate some some bit of analog. But analog music is where you see a whole band in a studio and everything is recorded analog, where you see a mixer board, a console. After you record everything, you mix everything like outboard stuff. So everything is outboard. Effects are outboard. That was what I was doing. Cause from Fredima Studios, I up oh, Fredima Studio was like a demo studio. So what it means is songs that we produce, they have to go to a bigger studio before we come to read. Our songs can go on reading. And the biggest studio of the time was CHM. And everybody knows CHM who made it popular. Did it take you to understudy in Fredima studio before you were moved to um, CHM? In Fredima studio, I was already with the keyboard, so like understanding the whole process where we use computers and stuff, it didn't really take long, like four, five, six months. So do you tell us, did you have a former teacher or somebody that took you through in all Fredima this process studio. in Fredima yeah, studio? Fred he the took owner. you through yeah, he all those me, processes? Like, how to then the popular software for recording music on the computer the atari computer was the first ever computer introduced into the production of music in ghana in the web right. atari computer and then the software that was popular at the time was Dotata and cubase but Dotata was more popular so he taught me how to even open i've never used computer before he was like this is computer this is how you log in into this black and white thing so that was, he taught me everything, how to record it, how to fix a microphone. Even though it was a small studio, eventually had everything that the bigger studio had, in, you know, the whole conception was mm. there. So Fred Chemisa was the one who taught me. So after joining the CHM studios, mm -hmm. so in CHM, that what, was what happened? <laughs> Were you mastering music yes, in CHM? Yes, in CHM. I went to CHM in 1997 because I completed um, it, my, my A-levels in 96 in my crack academy. So, in 1997, I went to CHM. That was when I moved to CHM. So in CHM, I had a chance to record my, you know, to write from production. Production as doing the beat, recording as recording the artist, mixing my own sound for the first time in CHM. I was given the opportunity by... It. And who was that artist that you started I'm with? I'm say that is Bookback. The very first album, when Small Comica came out. That was a big song in Ghana. You know, I didn't know it was going to be big. You know, and... Well, after doing the whole song, the whole album, and I heard the song on that was my first time I heard a song of, you know, finish everything. Your own creator. I was like, you know, I was like jumping head over heels. I don't even know what to do. I was so excited, you know. So I, my first song to ever come from CHM that I engineered everything was um, book back. I'm going to uh, comic again. Comic again. Then after that, around the same time, I did VIP's first album, Rana Sala. You know, these were things I did analog. I mix them on the console, I recorded them on the ADAT machine, nothing like computer where you sing into the computer nowadays, all the effects and the computer just plug in, we don't do that, you have to, I tune everything myself. Oh, come there, with yeah, well, uh, listeners, viewers, you are seeing live in the studios of Zip, uh, Zip TV in London, I am here with uh, Jeff Quay, popularly known as the of the Ghanaian music, from analog to digital. I want to know which of them encourages artistic value of a production. Is it the digital or the analog? You have gone through the two. I've gone through the two. Yeah, I I came to the industry where analog was taking me for digital. And if you study, um, if you look into you know digital recording. You know all the things that made it, like the apparatuses, the paraphernalia, and the digital recording. You realize that all digital recording wants to do is to do what analog does, but in a more simple way, in a more smaller way, in a more not too hard way. You know that is what digital, um, as far as I mean, recording or music is, 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 is concerned. 
And when it comes to, you know, the arts of it, like where arts, like you're saying, are really encouraged or really come to fall, I think we all know it is the analog music because it is only with analog music then you can get a real guitarist in your studio, then you can get a real trumpeter in your studio. So what we are doing now, you know, all the time, the upgrades that we keep getting in digital recording is upgrades that will make our music sound like analog. You know, upgrades where we can incorporate you know, some form of the analog recordings into what we do. So a, di a typical digital recorded music is a music where everything was done with the keyboard. The drums was probably sampled, the bass guitar, like everything that you hear, like a song like uh, Amukan Wum that I produce for here, it's a typical digital recording. Castro, digital re 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 recording, Mizgo, 16 years, all Lumba, all the songs I did for them, for they were all digital recordings. But what we do is, when we do it and we want it to go a little analog, that is where we have the art all involved, like feeling the beauty of uh, 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 live music, then we call the likes of like Pinto, a guitarist, will come and do some session with it. We call like a trumpeter, so that we read the trumpets from the keyboard, come and play. Mm. We call like a conquerors. So when you hear the music, even though it was digitally recorded, that a whole live band session wasn't put in studio to record, mm -hmm. you would think, oh, this sounds like live. So with the transformation of, you know, digital from analog, that is how far it is coming. So. Data recording initially killed analog recording, which you know saw most of our musicians relegated to the back. All they could do was live band music, they couldn't go to studios anymore because you go to a studio, you see a keyboard, and then you come up from your studio, you hear drums, bass, and everything. everything. I remember somebody asked me, Oh, I'm coming with that trumpet. Pam, 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 pam. Who is the trumpeter who played? I'm like, I did everything. He was like, You know, he's a little old fashioned. How can you do that? You know, and he asked, How can you do that? I'm like, That is what data recording does. So, Analog recording is, I think, what we are trying to incorporate into what we do as data, and that is what softwares that keep coming in the, in the digital world, trying to make it sound and make it look like. But what, when we look, we listen to certain music that uh, is being played in Ghana, mm -hmm. and we hear it here in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. uh, we think like. In fact, if you had gone a little bit of analog, that mm -hmm. could have even created mm -hmm. more employment because mm -hmm. a music can be played by a, a music is played by a band, a band. Mm -hmm. and a band consists of a lot of uh, people playing it. Yeah. So if we get them doing that, that would have uh, generated some form of employment and create job for other people to do. Mm -hmm. So why do we insist or why are we bent on let me, let me react. digitalizing our music okay. industry? Let me react to that. You know. When I got into the in music industry, I saw record companies, I saw music publishers, I saw Supercars Records was like a record company, all it does is executive producer and artists and probably distributing. I saw Abib Records, I saw Precise Music. These record companies are mentioned and no more. Over the period of time, all these people perished. So the artists, the musicians, they have to record in other ways with or without, without record companies so the budget is low these were businessmen now are these artists have to finance their uh, let me let me ask why do you think that all these record companies were fed out from the system uh, you know um, i think uh, the way our industry was structured at the time the way the industry was structured you no know, no laws regulating piracy and all these things you know and uh, distribution of funds percentages wise uh, between artists and um, executive producers and managers you know there were no regulations and structures in place so the industry at the time was such that it was a record company you know starts become successful at a diminishing rate you go up but whilst you're going up the curve is going to be the economic economics it's going to come down so we saw record companies from nowhere they became so popular you know, they start with one artist in like a year, so many artists in two, three years, shum, shum. And then that was what happened. You know, the regulations that were not in place and so many other things that started killing the industry like Ayola and other things made um, executive producers decided, well, you know, the re executive producers were businessmen. They had like two or three businesses going. So if music is killing the fans, they like, so all the publishing companies, you know, like about 80%, all kept going down and these were a must state 
these were publishers or companies that were into hip life high life were there publishers were because the lumbers and cool were still doing what they were doing but hip life those companies that came that started with supporting hip life, hip life. life they all no. have to Right. Now, uh, you have seen a lot of transformation in the music exactly. industry and you've gone through most of them. You were part and parcel of them, exactly. right from analog to digital, digital. right from Palongo, mm -hmm. uh, Jama, mm -hmm. through to nowadays Azonto. Uh, you've recorded the mm -hmm. old and the new together, right. you yeah. fused them together. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the motivation or what encouraged you mm -hmm. to change the old music that was being played mm -hmm. and listened to by the old people so and fuse it with a new generation mm -hmm. that also encouraged the youth mm -hmm. to keep on listening to the old music what encouraged you to do okay. that this is what happened um in the year 2000 um you know when hip life high life is older than hip life Hawaiian music is older than high life it was Hawaiian, it was high life and then it, became, it came to hip life so there was a wider market for high life because people who consumed high life music were elderly people, working class, who can afford the cassettes, the tapes, the records. Hip life was a, a movement, a revolution for the young, the youth in Ghana, because it was rap, fused with a little high life. But at the core, the, 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 the core of what we do in hip life, when it started in the 90s, when Reggie brought it, Reggie Rockstone brought it, was hip hop. So, you know, it was like people were not buying hip life. Students were following it. Students had no money to buy tapes. That time, downloads wasn't a part of what they do. You can only get to hear music on radio or go to shows and watch the artists. They can't afford tapes because they were students. So, and the older people couldn't understand what the young people were doing because the beats that we played at the time was hip hop. All the beats I played before 2000, before 2001, were all hip hop. All the high life, that, the hip life that came at the time. We're all hip hop because of the culture mm -hmm. of hip hop in hip life. So that was what happened. So I sat down and I looked at the whole industry with I, your economic lens. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, it's the lens is going to be a telescope. Right? <laughs> with an economic bifocal. Yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> you know, so I looked at this whole thing and I'm like, okay, we can bridge the gap. We can have a fusion. We can incorporate the two. How are we going to do that? These boys will rap regardless. You don't expect them to sing like Pabubu, Alaji K, Frimpong, Bulome. You don't expect them to do that. So what can we do? We can transform our beats, the production of the beats that makes the song. So I experimented being a gun. You know, I'm like, okay, High Life was already, you know, seen in hip life some way, some way, but the percentage was too. So I'm like, let me try something all new. Good. So coming from the shores of Accra, Choco, I took Pan Logo. Pan logo is what we do back in the people do back in the days as Jama. Jama. When you go to intercolleges, as Jama and Lolo, that was what we do. You know, so I took you know the risk and I'm like, let me try that. A typical high life club in Ghana is yeah. Pan logo Jama was actually actually. So that was there was in the those those it. that knows the music when they hear yeah. they know the difference they between know. a typical highlight. Yeah, and so Jama. I'm like, okay. Rather than playing all these hip hop beats, let me have the hip hop beats in the song, mm. but let me also bring a little jammer into it. And I experimented that with Bubak's song, I'm going to come. Wow. I'm going to come, I'm going to come. That was the first fusion where we have Jama ever introduced in Ghana. So when I eat, that was also the first time I started putting my signature in songs because I want people to identify me you. to my creativity yeah. and the revolution I brought. When it started, there was a lot of criticism. Oh, what is this? DJs even who play the music, what is this? What is that this that does this guy think he's doing? Where does he think he is going, going. with this? You know how typical when they try to kill it. But at this music, when controversy surrounds something artistic, it grows. There is no grows. negative publicity. You know, and within a couple of months, I'm going to come was accepted by the by all Ghanaians. I'm going to come was consumed by older folks. I, I'm going to come became a big song in Ghana. And then at the awards that time, he won about four awards. Just that song. Song. On the hip life category, he won, he stripped a lot of awards. So that was when I saw that this movement is going to work. So I started hearing it. Stradinam, George Arabis, I started hearing it. 
uh, all the songs the secret forex for every artist i produce around the time i have to let it go because it has to be loudable and it got extra loudable when people in the gospel folks Started. embraced it and as of now as we speak gospel has started doing jama high life also embraced it the lumbers the uh, uh, all these people started also playing it and it became accepted by all well viewers you are hearing it live in the studios of zip f zip tv i am here with jeff quay popularly known as jq a musical producer and engineer of all time in ghana and he's in fact going diaspora he's got a studio in the united states of america and he's here in the united kingdom to do some job as you all know now we are in a global village whereby everybody everybody or every soul is trying to go all over the world to encourage or to motivate people to get close to his net jq is here today with me in london but if you want to join in the conversation the numbers to call is 0203-290-3190 0203-290-3190 you can also join in but we'll be going for a quick commercial break when we bounce back pinto will also join us on and tell us what he can do with his hands on the guitar but before we go on a commercial break i would like to know uh the transformation from the high life to hip-hop to hip life there were a lot of criticism as i did uh, elaborate on earlier on that people were thinking that the hip life and the hip-hop music do not make sense and in fact some of them doesn't doesn't make any sense at all so as a producer and an engineer do you think that hip life or hip hop hip hop is gone hip life do you start to test uh, all right before you go on and i have somebody on the line to share his views with us hello 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 yeah we've lost this call and uh, hopefully he will call back or she will call back the numbers to call is 0203 you can call in you can phone in and share your join us on this program uh, the afternoon entertainment show on zip tv i'm here with jq uh, jay before i intercepted uh what uh we were talking about mm -hmm. the stand mm -hmm. test of time by the hip life music do you think yeah I think you pass through of a lot of waters yeah i think um hip life has come a long way um, failed in its genesis you know uh, made some whatever and then now i think he's still also there so for me i think if hip life is really going to die like it was perceived to be I mean, it would have been dead by now. All right, uh, let's pick some more calls in the studios. Hello, caller. Hello. 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 Hi, my name is Alga. I'm calling from Westwood Business Park. Yeah. What do you have for us this afternoon? We are oh, hi, you live from Claire in the studios of Zip TV in London. Hello. Hiya. Yes. Can you hear you? Yeah. It's just a quick question. Um, JQ has got stages in Ghana and in America. I'm just hoping to see what next is going to have one in the UK because we've got young OGs coming up and we're looking for people like him to, you know, put up a place like that here in the UK for us. So we just want to know when next he's going to do something like that in the UK. Yes, please, can you tell us because we did not hear what you said. Okay, um, hearing the once interview... You, once you can lower your uh, set for us, please, and tell us where you're calling from. I'm calling from Westwood Business Park. 
Yep. And um, in the interviews, I've heard him talk about studios in America and in Ghana. And I'm just wanting to ask when he's going to have a studio here in the UK. So young artists like people here can also try to put something together. All right. And he will tell you if he's going to have a studio here in England so that some of the young artists here can also record and have yeah. the signature of JQ. We thank you very much for your time with us. Tell people to listen to Zip TV online as we give you the best, not only in entertainment, every endeavors of your life. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, JQ, before you even go on, they are asking that having a studio in the United States of America and Ghana, are you going to have a studio in England to record a young artist? Yeah, um, before I, I started making trips to America, then I was making trips to London. You know, I've been here a couple of times and all my trips here was business. I record people. I, I collab with um, people who own studios in London because my time here are usually short. It's like going to my, like, my longest visit to the UK in, in, in so many years. And so, like I did, like Justice is one guy I've worked with. Um, in the past, his studio, I did some, some work with um, Kobe in East Ham and all that. And exactly, yes, very soon, not this year though, but very soon, I'm going to have a studio here in the UK. But I learned uh, now you are going to uh, work with multimedia, uh, mo solar multimedia. Oh yeah, solar, solar multimedia. multimedia. Like presently here now, all my works are going to be with Solar Multimedia, the recording studio in Solar Multimedia in Black Horse Street. That is where all my works are going to be. So until I come up with my own studio, this is the studio where I'm going to do all my recordings. But hey, um, they should watch out my, my studio. Is yes, you're hearing JQ here in the studios of Zip, Zip TV. You can also join in 02032. 903190. The numbers again 0203 2903190. Uh, we will go for a quick commercial break, but when we come back, we get in Pinto to also join in and share his opinion as far as music, music is concerned. We have here the producer of all time when it comes to Palongo uh, Jama through to the Azonto. He's here to give you a wonderful piece that you never uh, forget. You never regret joining in and sharing your opinions or having him done something for you. We'll go for a quick commercial break. When we come back, we continue on the show on the afternoon entertainment show on Zip TV. Stay tuned and do not go away. <laughs> 